uh, interesting talk. Um, today we have Dr. Jerry Croft from, um, he's a professor emeritus from Santa Clara University in the psychology department. That's right. But um, he, his interests in fields such as uh, mass psychology um, and the psychology of propaganda and collective psychology kind of, uh, I think, are part of, I think he'll tell us a little bit how we how we got here today um, with his psychological background, but some of the fields that he has expertise in and have, have led him to this topic of um, psychology and global warming. You know, why, why do so many people, why are there so many climate deniers out there? Why, why does that exist when there's so much scientific evidence? And um, so he will be talking to us a bit about that today. And um, I'm really thrilled to have someone talk to us about the psychology of um, our environmental issues, especially um, climate change, which is facing us. Because we know a lot about how we're affecting the environment, um, what we're, you know, what's going wrong from a scientific standpoint. What we need to do now is to change people's behavior, right? Get people to, <laughs> you know, to change what they're doing. So, um, and I think that Dr. Croft will tell us a little bit about that and how we might be able to get that to happen. It's not always that easy, but. Um, and so, also, here's the sign in sheet for those of you who um, would like to let me know that you were here today. And, uh, so let me turn it over to Dr. Croft. Okay, thank, thank you. Very much. I'm going to start with a couple little slides, and then I'll introduce myself. So with that dismal news, uh, what is a psychologist from Santa Clara University coming into a Department of Environmental Sciences to talk about anything? I mean, where, where, where are our competencies? So uh, I want to tell you, this is how psychology enters into this field. Come on. I don't think that it has been established yet as a fact that global warming is the issue of the day. So that's Michelle Bachman, who wanted to be president of the United States. Okay? So there's a great deal of denial uh, in our country, particularly. And uh, I wrote a book called Duped. And the chapter that I Xeroxed and sent out came from that book, but there's a newer book that I wrote. Uh, in which a more advanced chapter on this subject. But here we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about denial as a defense mechanism that is used primarily by the right, by Republicans. But there's also a more subtle defense mechanism used by the left, which I call displacement. It's a little controversial, so I thought I would start with less controversy to get so you wouldn't throw apples at me. All right, so uh, we get begin. This is the book that is coming out by Roman and Littlefield, a psychology text. Last chapter deals with global warming and the pros and cons of uh, how we're dealing with it. Okay, here are our deniers. These are, are the major deniers in American society, uh, and there are plenty of them. Senator James Inhofe, Michael Steele, the former head of the Republican Party, Glenn Beck, John Stossel, George Will, Sarah Palin out there. She's endorsing a new movie, an anti-climate change movie, just this week. Rick Santorum also ran for president and said, a global warming is patently absurd junk science. That's the second presidential candidate who said that in our country. Um, so this is from Fox News.
So we obviously have propaganda in our society. I mean, this is like Pravda and Izvestia in the days of the Cold War, only this is American independent news journalism. So if you were to look, here's John Coleman. I'm only concerned about the incredible frenzy and hype for something that's a total myth. That concerns me a lot because uh, people are going hysterical about it. It's amazing to me how uh, upset so many people are and how many billions of dollars apparently our governments are going to spend of our tax dollars to combat something that isn't real. That has my attention, believe me. Uh, as a scientist, I know the global warming doesn't really exist at all in any sense of significance and that we have nothing to worry about. So I thought you'd like that. <laughs> it puts you at ease. There's no reason for an environmental major. I looked up John Coleman's uh, credentials. He calls himself a scientist. His highest degree is a bachelor's degree in journalism. So I, I think he has never written a scientific paper in his life. But the point is that that man reaches more minds than all the people in this audience will reach in probably 15 years. He, pro he was probably talking to two million people when he said those words. And two million people take that home with them. So here is a little more on the right-wing nature of denial. There's Michael Savage and Rush Limbaugh, Glenn Beck. They work for a company, Bain Capital. Bain Capital used to be Clear Channel. Who do you think was the head of Bain Capital? Mitt Romney, who also wanted to be president of the United States. He writes the checks for these rhetoricians who are on the radio every day spouting the, the propaganda of denial. Now, here's Mike Savage. There is no man-made global warming. It's, it's, a, it's a scam to control businesses and impose the highest tax in American history to cripple the nation, destroy us. Okay, so uh, Glenn Beck reaches 7 million minds every day. Rush Limbaugh reaches 20 million minds every day. Michael Savage reaches 8 million minds every day. And there's a, the, the reason this is a Republican issue is because uh, there's an anti-tax element to it, but there's more. There's a, a foreign trade element to it, which we'll get to later. Okay, so uh, the effects of all this propaganda on attitudes, it's not that they're just broadcasting. It's getting assimilated, internalized. These are delusions that people have. For example, <clears throat> among Republicans who watch these folks, 67% say global warming is exaggerated. Among Republicans in 2011, 73% of staunch conservatives said there is no solid evidence for global warming. This is pretty effective propaganda. Among Republicans, 57% do not believe scientists believe global warming is occurring. In 2015, this is a late 2015 article in New York Times, of 278 Republicans in Congress, which is a majority, only uh, eight have made comments about global warming. That's 3%. Bernie Sanders put up a, an amendment to a bill. Global warming is caused by human activity. It was defeated in the fall. So we have a serious problem. Science Magazine just recently polled 1,500 high school teachers, social science teachers, uh, to discover a third 30% are teaching their students that global warming is a natural phenomena unrelated to human activity in our high schools. So maybe we're the ones who are in denial. Maybe they're right. How, maybe we're uh, some kind of a cult of people who believe in something that's false. I mean, we have some empirical ob obligation to say, no, no, that's all, ri that's ridiculous. John Coleman is a fraud. So here, let's take a look at just some of our facts that you already know. I'm preaching to the choir. Carbon emissions in Antarctic ice cores, bubbles, 27% um, greater than in the last 650,000 years. I have a friend, Russian scientist, Silicon Valley engineer, very right wing, smart as a whip, is you don't know your science. I said, why, what's wrong with that? He said, don't you know science must be corroborated? That's only one study. 
And I said, well, there's another study that dug another ice core. And it said the same thing. And it goes back 800,000 years. And here's a little video clip on that. So from ice cores, we can measure what the temperature was in the past from an instrument like this. And we can also determine what the carbon dioxide concentration, for example, was in the past from the bubble that we talked about earlier. The oldest ice core we've got is 800,000 years old. And this plot shows the temperature going from ice ages down here up to warm periods up here. And it also shows what carbon dioxide was doing at the same time. And carbon dioxide was also going up and down. So the temperature was making the carbon dioxide rise. The carbon dioxide was making the temperature rise. And perhaps the most interesting thing on here is the sharp rise at the end here in carbon dioxide, which is what happened in the last 200 years, where it goes up to levels that are unprecedented in the last 800,000 years. So there's the corroborating study. And uh, it's quite clear that, at, at least from the, but let's talk a little more science here. In 2003, 90% of scientists said global warming was real and due to human activity. They redid the survey with 1,372 PhDs. Now 97% of scientists say that John Coleman is an idiot. Well, they don't say he's an idiot, but that he's wrong. The number of record highs exceeds the number of record lows by a factor of two to one in the last decade. Now, if you watch Fox News and there's a record low in Wyoming, there's John Coleman saying, how could there be global warming? They haven't had the low like that in Wyoming in 76 years. OK. So they always exaggerate the so one set of facts and ignore the other. Uh, a few more pieces of information here. There have been 327 consecutive months where global temperatures exceeded their long-term averages. 11 of the past 12 years have been the hottest since 1850. Forest fires in the United States consume six and a half times more acreage than they did 40 years ago. Two separate studies predict that the summer ice in the Arctic will be gone Within, uh, the, within a decade, that'll be the first time in 125,000 years that there will be no summer ice in the Arctic. That's as old as Homo sapiens. But a picture is worth a thousand words, and that's the North Pole in 1979, that's the North Pole in 2003 in the summer, and that's the North Pole in 2010. So if you're, that doesn't convince you, then I don't know where the Republicans are living, but they're living in a fantasy land, and they represent a very large chunk of American consciousness. Now, uh, there's something else to talk about here. If you're living in a dream and you're denying a reality that exists, there's a, that's a form of mental illness for an individual, but it's also a form of collective mental illness for a country, for a national character. Now, there's another, this is the one that's a little controversial. The second defense mechanism has to do with us liberals on the left. Get ready. I thought I would start easy. This is the toughie. So liberals are not in denial. 80% of liberals believe there is solid evidence for global warming. 64% of liberals say it is a very serious problem versus 73% of conservatives who say it isn't. That's a big dichotomy in the way Americans are thinking. However, in Freudian psychology, there's a thing called displacement. It's a defense mechanism, like denial, but it's a healthier defense mechanism. You have trouble with your boss. He's bipolar. He's crazy. He's driving you nuts. He's making impossible demands. You're frustrated. You can't take it. The appropriate behavior is to deal with the boss, be a whistleblower, file a complaint. It's too risky to do that. You can lose your job. Displacement means you take your anger, your energy, and you redirect it to someplace safer. You come home, and you bitch to the dog. And you are abusive to your wife. And, but you do not deal with the source of the problem. The energy gets directed outward, but it's displaced away from its true source that it should be directed at. That's what displacement is. So let's take a look at the left. One of the elements of the left is Gandhi. Be the change you wish to see in the world. 
live an ethical lifestyle. Be conscious of how you live, okay? Here's part of that mantra. Reduce, reuse, recycle, change your light bulbs, plant a tree, eat locally produced food, buy energy efficient appliances, uh, ethical eating and consumption, just make a trip to Portland sometime, uh, vegetarianism and veganism, drought resistance plants, sustainable living, the sustainable living festival, okay? So the question is, What's wrong with that? Really, what's wrong with me? That's, that's my idea of doing something for the planet. Get ready. The question is, it isn't working. When you go home and you kick the dog, it's not solving the problem that exists. So when you look at the statistics, US carbon emissions are up 3.9% in 2010. World carbon emissions are up 29% since 1990, since Kyoto. The CO2 emissions increased at triple the rate since Clinton was president. Global carbon emissions increased 2.9% in 2013. The world hit 401 parts per million, first time in 3 million years. Something is not working. So, I want to make this point a little gradually. We're going to get Atherton, California, and Humboldt County, okay? Atherton, average income. This is a Mediterranean climate, warmer in the winters, cooler in the summers, very rich, $70,000 average family income in Atherton. That all? That's all. Exactly. That's median, median. 70% of Atherton is democratic and totally green, okay? Now let's go to Humboldt County. Average income, $40,000. There are a few more Republicans in Humboldt, but they make about half what they make in Atherton. And it's colder in the winter and hotter in the summer. Okay? Now, the fact of the matter is that Atherton, California, green, wonderful Atherton, Bernie Sanders country, uses 33% more electricity per capita than does Humboldt County. I'd like to introduce you to a man from Atherton who would, if he were sitting here, would be really unhappy. And he would say, hey, listen, buddy, psychologist, psychobabble, displacement, okay? I have invested more in global warming than ever you could ever hope to. You see that air conditioner? I ripped out all the air conditioners in my house. That is the most energy efficient air conditioner made in this country. And I have it in every room in my house my hot tub is the most energy smart hot tub that exists, okay? You see that refrigerator? It's called the Tree Hugger. It cost me $9,000. There is no more energy efficient re uh, refrigerator in the United States, okay? So I really resent you. Talk um, I, my, I drive a Tesla. My wife drives a Tesla and my two children drive Priuses, okay? So if I were added up by the way, I bet you shop at Trader Joe's with a paper bag instead of a cloth bag, don't you? Okay, I really resent you. I'm a member of the board of Earth First, so I totally take offense at what you're saying. So in psychology, we say, well, thanks for sharing. <laughs> But it doesn't, all of the rhetoric, all of the political correctness, all of the blather, all of the indignation, all the moral superiority does not change reality. And that is that that man uses 30% more electricity than the average person in Humboldt County. Al Gore uses too much electricity in his house. It's a question of wealth almost more than value. So let's take it out of the personal and take a look at uh, the same phenomena but in a, in a larger sense. Let's go to Mexico. Mexico has one third the population of the United States. Three times more here than there. Do we use three times more electricity than Mexico? So talking the talk, walking the walk. If you're talking the talk and saying, I hate my boss, he's a real whatever, but you're not doing anything about it. There's a discrepancy between talking the talk and walking the walk. You're kicking your dog. It's easier to kick your dog than to do what, ha what has to be done at your job. So let's take a look at Mexico. 
The United States has 18,000 organizations devoted to the environment, sustainability, conservation, droughts. They have classrooms, they have projects. You're probably subscribers. We have 18,000. Mexico has about 60. That means we have 300 times more organizations devoted to the planet and to the environment than does Mexico. We are 300 times greener than Mexico, at least in terms of talking the talk. But now let's talk about walking the walk. How much electricity do you use, pal? Well, the United States versus Mexico is electricity consumption, which is a close correlate of the carbon footprint. Is it three times greater than Mexico? Nope, it's 13 times greater than Mexico. The average person in America, well, it's because we have bigger industries, we have more Priuses, more flat screen TVs, more industries, but we, our carbon footprint is many times greater than it should be. And it's really not a question of values or talking the talk, it's a question of wealth. So let's go to Brazil and see if the same Atherton Humboldt County thing generalizes. Brazil is a very developed country. Its GDP is greater than all of South America countries combined. We have 1.5 times more people than Brazil. Do we use 1.5 times more electricity? Again, we have 18,000 organizations. They have about 200. Again, we're hundreds of times greener than Brazil when it comes to talking the talk. But we use six times more electricity than Brazil does. It's a, it's a more developed country than Mexico. So it, this is the Atherton Humboldt issue. And the fact is that we are not coming down off of our plateau. Now, if we were to face the consequences of reality and deal with reality instead of our delusions and instead of denial, what would that look like? Well, it, by the time you retire, graduate students, when you're 65, diseases like malaria, yellow fever, will reach Europe and North America. By the time you retire, a million species will have gone extinct. Tigers, pandas, rhinos, sturgeons, alligators, parrots, sharks, gorillas, tunas, elephants, leopards, polar bears, gazelles. No more when you're collecting Social Security. The Caribbean ecosystem will collapse and agricultural production in South America will decline by 50%. These are uh, empirically supported there. The footnotes are in my book. Wildfires and droughts, hurricanes and cyclones will be run of the mill events in your retirement. Mil uh, the melting of the Himalaya glaciers will impact 500 million people in India and China who depend on water runoff for their survival and for agriculture. You know most of these things, but it's interesting to assemble them all in one place. Uh, there may be a change in the Gulf Stream, and uh, uh, areas like Europe could turn into uh, landscapes like Siberia. So what is the, how, do you deal, what, what, how do we deal with reality? If we suddenly say, let's give up our defense mechanisms. Well, reality is two countries. These two countries are responsible for 42% of all the carbon emissions on this planet. We need to stop these two countries. They're about the same size geographically. One has four times more people than the other. So let's start with us. How would we reduce emissions down to 1990 levels or 1985 levels? Well, let's talk about some really radical changes. Forget about Trader Joe's cloth bags. What if we took the price of gasoline and doubled it? The United States burns more gasoline than the next 20 countries combined. What if it was $8 a gallon? You know, like it is in England and Italy and France. Well, that would cut down our gasoline consumption by 40%. But it would not solve our problem of global warming or the US emissions. It would just take it down a few percentage points. Except there is no one in the United States saying, hey, let's double the price of gasoline and run for president. <laughs> Um, in World War II, they rationed sugar, they rationed electricity. What would happen if we rationed electricity? Electricity is 30% of our carbon emissions. 
you get a, a note, the man in Atherton, and it says, you're allowed 1,025 kilowatt hours, and if you exceed that, your house goes dark. What are you going to do? You're going to turn off four of your five flat screens. You're going to unplug two of your Priuses. You're going to shut off the hot tub entirely. And you're going to open, air condition one room instead of six. OK? And then maybe you'll make it to the end of the month. That was happened in World War II. It is not on anybody's agenda to this day. Can you name a single person who's saying, I think we should ration electricity in America? Nobody. So these are really radical solutions that come from some radical people. Uh, the United States has 97 million farting cows. They fart methane. Uh, the average person in the United States eats nine pounds of red meat a month. What if it was rationed and you could eat four and a half pounds of red meat a month? There goes Wendy's, Burger King, Carl's Jr.'s, all out of business. And what if you culled America's cattle herd by 20% so that instead of 97 million cows, you had 80? That would not solve the problem. Uh, farting cows are 18% of our greenhouse gas emissions, methane. Oh, that doesn't take care of the problem. But no one is suggesting that. But those are very draconian measures that would start to deal with reality. Here's oxide is defined as one. The warming potentials of all other gases are ranked in comparison to CO2. The GWP of methane, for example, is 72 when averaged over 20 years. In other words, methane heats the atmosphere 72 times more than CO2 over the course of 20 years. The reason that it's a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is because the structure of the molecule traps more of the infrared radiation, more of the heat. Where does methane come from? Human methane emissions are from meat, from livestock. One cow produces 200 pounds of methane each year, an equivalent of 14,400 pounds of CO2. Due to intensive livestock grazing, there are today more than 1.53 billion cows in the world, each emitting 200 pounds of methane, leading to an astounding 21.6 trillion pounds of CO2 equivalent emitted annually. This is more than three times the world's cars, all the power plants in the world. All the emissions of industrialized nations of Australia, Brazil, Canada, France, Japan, United Kingdom, and United States combined. But there is no movement in the United States to ration red meat. I, can't even, I could only find a couple organizations, one in England, that is pr proposing it. So Lester Brown, I don't know if you're familiar with him, he's sort of a radical. You read that book and it'll scare you to death, World on the Edge. He says the idea of, of think globally, act locally needs to be replaced by think globally, act globally. We need to change our mantra and get out of the uh, idea that we're doing our part by buying a tree hugger refrigerator. The kind of things that we need to do, he says, he's got another book, a more recent book, are like in World War II, there are no 1942 Buicks. You can't find a 1942 Buick because we didn't make cars in World War II. We made tanks. The entire economy changed, and in three years, we built thousands of tanks. We thought we could build 60,000 military aircraft. We actually built 230,000 military aircraft. Companies that made marbles made bullets. And if we had that kind of resolve that this country really needs to to have a wartime footing and a wartime economy in dealing with this problem, our uh, approach to it would be radically different. For example, Lester Brown said, if you built not a demonstration solar farm on 50 acres, but a 100 square mile solar farm in the center of the Nevada desert, it would cost well over a trillion dollars. Some say even $18 trillion. There are different estimates. That would be enough to power the entire United States on a sunny day. There are no such proposals. Elon Musk made another one. It's called the Blue Square in Texas. He had the same idea. He put it in Texas. Hundreds of square miles of solar farms could change the entire, comple the entire um, greenhouse gas emissions system of the United States. 
uh, T. Boone Pickens, an oil man, said the United States is the Saudi Arabia of wind. If we had, uh, from Texas all the way through Nebraska, uh, wind farms, we could almost solve America's energy needs. Uh, but there are counties and cities and states who say you're not going to put that that uh, thing on our property or in our county or near our city. If you, the federal government would have to use the power of eminent domain to make that true, and uh, there is no movement to do that. There are also politically incorrect solutions, like nuclear power, which is clean. It's risky, but if you're in an emergency situation, there are some new reactors that are safer and that we are building none. I think we might be building one. China's building 37. In the world, there are building 60. Uh, but there are two environmentalists, including the guy who is for 360 ppm, I forget his name, Jim Hansen, who's in favor of, of us to go rapidly trying to deploy nuclear power now. China is building 27 nuclear power plants. It produces 20% of US electricity. We need to get started. There's another one. This is really politically incorrect, fracking. I mean, who's in favor of fracking in this department? But one thing about fracking, it reduced the price of natural gas to a point that it's probably cheaper than it's been in years, and coal-fired power plants are converting to natural gas, which makes them 30% cleaner, which brings them down to 1985 levels. So there, at least we have to be objective on whether or not fracking becomes an option. So if we doubled the price of gasoline, we rationed electricity, we stopped exporting red meat, you could only have four and a half pounds a month. We invested a trillion dollars in solar farms and perhaps equal amounts in, in a national resolve to have wind farms and to eliminate, completely eliminate coal burning in this country. We could bring things down to 1985 levels, probably by 2019 if we had the mentality that we had in World War II, which we don't have. Our research budget for global warming is 1 400th of what we spend on defense. So clearly we're not there. But that's only half the problem. China is emitting more than we are. What are we thinking of doing there? Their CO2 emissions are 23% of the planet and they're non-stoppable, unstoppable. China burns more coal than the US, Japan, and Europe combined. 75% of China's uh, electricity comes from burning dirty coal, much dirtier than ours. 800 million Chinese burn coal in their homes. It is a lower grade of coal with higher sulfur emissions. China is building two coal fire power plants every week. It has 10 million diesel trucks that spew sulfur, nitrous oxide into the atmosphere, delivering Barbie dolls from the factory to the port that takes them to Walmart, which is why Walmart is not interested in your global warming ideas. Okay, so those, those diesel trucks are 130 times dirtier than the diesel trucks in Los Angeles. Uh, China produces the Asian brown cloud. You're probably familiar with it. It can cover an area the size of Australia. It is three kilometers thick. It comes from burning dirty coal. It is responsible for 25% of the air pollution in Los Angeles. All that car exhaust and pollution from power plants and factories, all that smoke, soot and ash from cooking food and burning crops, it all has to go somewhere. And that somewhere is here, from the ground looking up. It's the heavy blanket of smog which seems to be an almost permanent fixture of many Asian cities. From satellite photos looking down, it can be seen stretching across India, China and beyond. Scientists call it an atmospheric brown cloud, a toxic cocktail two miles deep, covering tens of millions of square miles from the Arabian Peninsula. Okay, so... Uh... There, China talks a good talk, by the way. Like, we're cutting down, we're cutting back, we're go, do, doing a lot in solar. Uh, but, in fact, they are increasing their electricity production 14%. In, uh, the, in 2011, they produced 95 million tons of coal. They tried to double that by 2012. 
If you double the production, you're going to double the burning. They, uh, that, that's a graph of Chinese uh, uh, CO2 emissions. Do not adjust your set. These are the latest pictures from the Chinese city of Harbin after being shut down by smog on Monday. The World Health Organization recommends daily levels of particulate matter with a diameter of 2.5 micrometers to be no more than 20. Anything above 300 is considered dangerous. Levels around 1,000 were recorded in some parts of Harbin. All schools were shut and the airport was closed. Harbin is home to some 11 million people and lies in the northeastern Heilongjiang province of China. Other parts of northeastern China also experienced severe smog. Visibility has reduced to only around 10 meters, causing huge traffic jams. China's leadership is concerned about air quality because it is a constant source of public anger. The sm so uh, the question then becomes, uh, well, how do we deal with this? I mean, we can't go to war with China. How do we stop it? China burned 3.6 billion tons of coal in and plans on burning 4.2 billion by 2020, which means they're going to increase their coal burning 15% in the next six years. Despite what, the, if you read his speech at the UN, it was very nice, very green, but this is the reality of China. In 2015, China approved 155 new coal-fired power plants which will have the capacity to equal 40% of all the coal power plants in the United States. And these are just the new ones that it is planning. But it's also exporting coal. Uh, 2015 Shetty by, oh, this is, sorry, I haven't got to exporting coal yet. Erase that. Uh, a 2015 study shows that Chinese coal burning has been incorrectly estimated. It's actually 17% more than they said it was. And here's the scary one. China is planning to build 14 new coal-fired power plants in Vietnam within five years and 92 plants in 27 other countries. That creates an export market for its coal. These are not happy statistics. Is it possible to stop Chinese CO2 emissions? How are we going to do it? It's the world's greatest polluter. What if we had legislation to prohibit trade with gross polluters? Do you remember dolphins and tuna? They were catching tuna and dolphins were dying. And people said, I'm not going to buy chicken of the sea if they kill dolphins. And within a couple of years, they changed their nets. And now you can buy tuna that is caught without killing dolphins. The same thing, China has $3 trillion. If there was legislation that said, no Barbie dolls, if the plant that produces it is burning coal to generate its electricity. You can't sell them in, the, in this country. They'd convert, they'd get scrubbers, they'd get down to business. But there is no such attitude among Republicans particularly to impact Chinese behavior. Walmart is the eighth biggest trading partner of China, bigger than most other countries. Virtually everything sold in Walmart comes from China. There's also Best Buy, Target, JCPenney, GM, Mattel, Toys R Us. Those are the ones that are buying $3.50 an hour labor production with coal burning power plants that manufacture our stuff. So we would have to get the United States, the EU to say no more imports from China until we can certify those plants are clean. That's the only way to deal with it. So let's talk psychology for a minute, one more time. This is a, a psychology example. Here's a girl who is got a mother and a father. She graduates from high school. She gets involved with drugs. She leaves the area. She gets involved with crystal meth. Then she apparently gets involved with heroin. She's living on the streets. It's rumored. She's prostituting herself. She's living with her boyfriend on the streets, prostituting herself. The police knock at the door when she's 19. She doesn't, the parents haven't heard from her in two years. And they say she's under arrest. She stole a television in Reno, Nevada. Okay, let's talk about denial and delusion. Mom is doing denial. Here's what it looks like. I don't want to hear about it. I know my daughter is good. I raised my daughter. I know that people go through phases. Children act out. They go, I don't want to hear any of this stuff. I don't believe any of this stuff. These are just bad things people are saying about my daughter. She is a good person. She will come home. Everybody goes through a phase, and she goes through a phase. So don't talk to me about that. That's denial, right? 
Let's do di uh, displacement. Dad, he's not in denial. He's heard about crystal meth. He's heard about the heroin. He's heard about the homelessness. And he said, okay, here's what I'm doing. First of all, I'm renewing my faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to church every morning at 8 o'clock. I'm going to Mass every single day and praying for her. That's the first thing I'm going to do. And the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sue the school system that, because there was a rogue teacher that introduced her to drugs, and he's still teaching there. And I want to sue the school system and stop that. that and I spend virtually all day long on the litigation against that school. Good. That's wonderful, Dad. Why is that displacement? Can you fault the guy for going to church? No. Can you fault the guy for suing? No. But what should be done? She's the patient. She's like Mother Earth. What are you doing for her? What does she need? She needs a private detective to find out where she lives and what street she's, what homeless street she's on. She needs a little money. She needs to be put in a homeless shelter. She needs money for rehab. She needs a lawyer to defend herself against the accu. Nobody's doing that. But dad's doing this and mom's doing that. And that's kind of what we're doing on the issue of global warming, at least from the perspective of some people. So if you take right-wing denial and then you add in left-wing displacement where people are do really trying to do something, they're committed, they have a moral idealism that cannot be faulted but it is not producing the kind of results that need to be produced. So let's pretend that Obama meets a Martian. The Martian comes and he talks to Obama and he says, Mr. Obama, we've heard you're the most powerful person on your planet. So we would like to ask you a question. If you will look at this graph, sir, you will see that you're, we monitor the gases of your planet and that black line represents your CO2 emissions. And we'd like to ask you, why aren't you doing anything? And Obama said, wait a minute, we're doing lots of things. We have Earth Day. You know, we have a school curricula. We have organizations. I have sponsored legislation. Yeah, I, and look, that only goes to 2000. I didn't even become president then. Well, Mr. Obama, we monitor your gases continuously. And these are your emissions since you became president. And they have increased 7.5% since that time. So our question to you is, why haven't you done anything about stopping this? You're ruining your planet. But wait, you don't understand. Look at Denmark. Denmark has got wind power. It has electrical power. Look at the conference in Doha. Look at the Kyoto. Look at the Paris Accords. Look at what we're doing. <laughs> and then the, uh, the Martian says, well, if you will look at the blue line, sir, that's the number, that's the CO2 parts per million. It is not going down. And the red line is your fossil fuel emissions. Nothing is going down. The question, Mr. Obama, is why aren't you doing anything? Well, I thought I would throw in my Martian. So uh, we're getting nothing from all of our efforts. The laboratory in Hawaii started tracking atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide in 1958. Then there were 316 parts per million. This red sawtooth line shows the annual fluctuations, but the overall direction is clear. 55 years later, those levels have now peaked at over 400 parts per million. No one, I think, can be uh, aware of what's going on and think that we are going to avoid serious and probably dangerous climate change in the future. We have to get ready for that. One more here. We're hitting the planet in a very, very dangerous way. And I just hope a headline like 400 parts per million just might trigger a little bit of shock in people, because you should be shocked. What are we doing? For the last 20 years, scientists, governments and businesses have been talking about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, including carbon dioxide, but few countries have made any meaningful changes. That conversation has been going on now for uh, several decades, and what we see looking at the atmosphere is really no change in the behavior with this accelerating rise. Although we haven't made a whole... 
So I think I'm coming to a conclusion here. Uh, these are minority voices who uh, need to be heard. You know probably many of them. Uh, Ralph Nader, Lester Brown, T. Boone Pickens, Ken Caldera, James Hansen, Richard Heinberg. Uh, they don't get the attention that John Coleman gets. Most people don't never heard of them. But they're, they're, they're the, the, the voice in the darkness that is trying to say this is a very serious matter. So double the price of gasoline, ration met meat, cull America's cattle herd, stop the export of red meat, ration electricity, massive national development of solar farms in Nevada or North, North Texas, a rapid deployment of natural gas conversion and nuclear power, massive development of wind farms and associated infrastructures, increased federal research and development by a factor of 10, cessation of all foreign trade with China or a carbon tax. None of these things is on the agenda of the American political climate right now at all in 2016. These are like crazy ideas by crazy people. A CEO from Wisconsin Energy said, anything that we do, if China does not stop its coal burning, will amount to nothing. If everybody bought a Prius in this country, if we don't do anything about China, it'll mean nothing. So uh, there is a ship coming. Just to show you the absence of political resolve, there's a ship that is unloading from China in Oakland and in Long Beach. There are no pickets there. There are no demonstrators. There are no Occupy Wall Street saying, stop this. Do not bring these Barbie dolls into this country. Okay, there are 8,500 Walmart stores. The Walmart heirs have more money than 140 million American families. They don't want uh, us to have any imp impede their China operations, and neither do these other importer exporters. There are no pickets in front of Walmart passing out leaflets saying, do not shop here. There are coal fire palm plants still in the United States, burning coal. No one's ringing the coal plant saying, stop, shut this place down. So our energies seem to be misplaced. 30% of the American electorate appears to be in a state of denial. Uh, another part, I don't know how big, has a delusion that it is doing its part, that it is having its effect. It, it, uh, I bought a Prius. And that's all I need to do. I'm making my payments. And so how, uh, this part is in denial, this part is diluted, and the other part is now America is in a state basically of paralysis. And when you're facing a conflict and there's nothing that you're doing about it that's effectively dealing with it and you're pretending, then you are in effect living in a state of denial and mental illness. And that is the psychologist's story for global warming. Thank you very much. And this book is not, this book is not out yet, but it'll be out in the summer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, very positive. Okay, questions. Should I shut that up or keep this on? students didn't jump in on something first. <laughs> um, distributed generation rather than those big giant solar farms, but I agree, solar certainly is better than spinning magnets because spinning magnets cost us water or fossil fuels. The politics, you said the money was coming from Clear Channel. That money is coming from the fossil fuel industry who also buy the politicians who are their mouthpieces. Koch Brothers contributed $67 million to anti-global warming propaganda. Just those two guys. Just those two guys. But, uh, I, I had a man I put on Facebook one day that showed the Republican politics versus the fossil fuels mined in their respective states. Oh. And that was a clear picture of why that mouth is saying what it's saying. Mm -hmm. In unison, of course, and it spreads probably to their colleagues mm -hmm. in other not fossil fuel mining states because the fracking that's pretty much covered the continent. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if there's Mitch, anybody who doesn't have an interest politically in. And Mitch McConnell calls it Obama's war on coal. You know. Others? 
Yes. Um, so I completely agree with all you have to say. Um, and I think that I, I have often talked to my students about how in World War II we turned on a dime, you know, to, yes. meet, to meet the threat that faced us. And I, I sort of think that humans as a species are kind of like, we just won't do anything until <laughs> our lives are threatened, you know, until it's, you know. But one thing I would say about people taking personal action, and I, I think as educators, we have to recognize the downside, but um, no legislator ever took action unless it's public said, you need to clean up our air. That's right. And the public who said that were first educated about it and had taken some action themselves. So I think unless people actually do personally take action, they will they do not know what should be done. And they won't advocate to have it done on the large scale, which which is what we really need to do. So that that's one thing I would say. But I think the downside is making sure people don't realize, oh, this is all I need to do. You know. I agree with that entirely, except where what I have not seen really large public demonstrations. There was a one in New York, there was one in London. But n nothing like a million man march on Washington, remember? When is that going to happen? 350.org has pulled off some pretty good demonstrations and got some coverage, but oh. it's not there yet. Yeah. I also just wanted to say something about the gas tax, uh, if you double the price of gas. I was kind of a late boomer and just finished watching the West Wing series. And they did all these issues, they laced everything into that series. And as the president was leaving the second term, he had to introduce a budget. He added 50 cents to the gas tax, and that was going to reduce the $16 trillion deficit in half, just 50 cents. So getting rid of that deficit, and who owns our deficit? China. That's a real scary thing. So we start messing with China politically. Do they start calling $8 billion worth of, of national debt? What does that do to us in return? So it, it's, it's a crazy game. Yes, it is. There are many variables. And um, you know, I'm, I, I approach it like Malcolm X. Do you remember Malcolm X? His attitude was, uh, by any means necessary. And if you really think that the global warming crisis is the greatest crisis facing humanity, then um, all the other things get suspended, whether China is going to react this way, whether fracking people are going to be upset. If you just say we need to do everything possible as quickly as possible, then uh, all the options come on, on, on the table. Uh, yes, sir. Um, so I, I think what I know is that the US, if you break down every individual's carbon footprint, about a third of it um, is allocated to transportation. And I noticed um, that wasn't really talked about in any of your proposed solutions. So I wonder if that, if you're conscious of that, and if you, if there are reasons why you haven't um, talked about transportation habits. Uh, to explain t for me what you mean by that. Uh, to rail, air. Um, all just net transportation. So daily personal transportation, and in, in including like a uh, flight, or if they take public transportation, um, just all of their total personal transportation. Uh, uh, um, I, di I, didn't, I didn't see a, uh, uh, a lever there to pull, but, uh, pardon? The increase in gasoline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the increasing the glass was, was a quickie, a quick thing, but building a hyperloop or, uh, or a different kind of uh, transportation system, I don't know how, how quickly it would, it would change things. Certainly the Tesla is an improvement. I just, um, I wonder if you just consciously maybe didn't touch it because that may imply a sol solutions based around sort of um, lifestyle as as far as like where you live and where you work. Because mo most of that is coming from commuting to work every day. So uh, that, that has to do with a lot of like infrastructure and city planning. And that's like a really hairy problem and it takes a long time to get through that. So I wonder if that's maybe why you didn't. Uh, well, my daughter is very much into uh, urban commuting with bicycles and creating more lanes, and I just don't know um, 
uh, I haven't seen the data that would show if you do this and 40% of the commuters got on bicycles, what that would mean with respect to our global greenhouse emissions. And like, for example, uh, in San Diego, which is a very similar city to Copenhagen, there was a bicycle traffic could be, there aren't that many hills in San Diego, whereas San Francisco is a toughie. But it would be great for a bicycle uh, commuting. And, uh, and, uh, and Denmark is way ahead of us, and so is Barcelona on, on those, and Amsterdam. So, but I, don't, uh, I haven't seen any statistics that would show this would be the dramatic payoff. But you, you're probably right that uh, that that's, should be well, there. I think it, should, it traces back to our sort of urban sprawl um, sort of roadmap that we've gone through in this country, and it, it's playing a huge factor, I think, in, I mean, if, if that is true that we're around 30%, and it's mostly due because we live outside of the city or, you know, 20 or 30 miles from the city that we work, and we transport ourselves every day, and that's where a lot of, you know, a third of our carbon footprint is coming from. Um, that isn't maybe the easiest thing to change, but it would be a sort of, uh, it would be able to take a large chunk, I guess, out of our uh, footprint if we could figure out a way to live closer to where we work. On the other hand, if you raise the price of gas by 100%, people would get on bicycles very rapidly. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe that's the independent variable and everything. And I'm not putting down lifestyle changes yeah. as being important, but uh, getting it done quickly is, uh, you know, how are you going to move half the population to within t five miles of their job instead of 20? Yeah. That's, a, that's a big... Uh, yeah, that's why I was wondering if maybe you uh, skip that. For, uh, I, skip, I skip that. It's too hard. <laughs> you got, you got a psychological problem there with the, the bubble. People are in the bubble in their cars. They like that little yeah. privacy. They call the bus, you know, the, the shame train. There's only poor people in there, or people who are sleeping on the bus overnight. So mm -hmm. the bus is actually, our VTA uh, participation's gone down in the last couple of years. Has it really? Yes, that's scary because we're, we're, we're painting more bicycle lanes, and, and, and the commuters are screaming that we're taking away lanes from them. And at the same time, they can't see they need an alternative. They're still, they still want that bubble. So go into a Prius bubble or, or a Tesla bubble is still the bubble. But it satisfies that isolation that they they want from the mass, mm -hmm. and that you know affluence gives them the ability to do that. They're not going to let that go easily. Mm -hmm. They might let go fast food faster than they let go. Mm -hmm. Home spend ten minutes cooking. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So, how much longer do you think we have trailing down this path? And we really have no choice. I think twenty twenty is the year. Now, is that the year that all shit hits the fan, or is that the year that we make the change? No, that's the year that shit hits the fan, I think, because 2020 is, uh, two scholars I read said that's the year that the Arctic ice in the summer will be gone, and that will precipitate a dark polar cap. The albedo of the Earth uh, will not reflect back that sunlight. The Arctic is warming, warming four times faster than the rest of the Earth. And unless we get uh, something to change by 2020, I think it's downhill from there. There are other people who are more optimistic, but I, uh, and you're the scientists here, so I, I think you're much more qualified to talk about that. That's only my personal opinion. So I, I think we only have four years. I, I feel a, a real sense of revolutionary urgency. But, you know, yes. So um, from a psychological standpoint, um, maybe you don't have an answer to this, but you know, so you talked about 2020, you know, if, if you know, some big catastrophes happen, psychologically, when do societies change, radically change their I lives? have an answer, I, I, Lester Brown's answer. Okay. Lester Brown said it was Pearl Harbor. Yes. When Pearl Harbor, which was the, releasing event. They didn't need to have open draft boards. They had a million people volunteer to join the army. People dropped out of college just like that. They didn't have to draft people. They were overwhelmed with volunteers. And, the, and converting the economy was simple. 
it, it didn't, there wasn't a lot of resistance from labor unions in Detroit or anything. It was like, we're, uh, we're, the expression was, there's a war on, you know. Mm -hmm. So if there was a, a catastrophic hurricane in the United States like Katrina or some kind of event, like in 2013, 50 percent of all the counties in the United States were declared federal disaster areas because of a drought. If you have a, some, some event like that, that might turn the tide of psychology towards everyone saying, yes, we have to do this right now. But I don't think yeah, we're there yet. It has to be an event. I mean, even the drought conditions were not. I think it has to be an event, sort of like Pearl Harbor um, or um, the attack on the Twin Towers. We go, this thing happened, and it's not going to happen. Exactly. Whereas like Superstorm Sandy, I mean, I thought, okay, that's it. We're going to start getting on board. No, because we go, oh, this is a one-time thing. And then the Koch brothers come. Right. With, so I think it's one of those things where, it's, do you think where people have to go, well, this bad, bad thing happened, and it's going to happen again and again and again. It's yes. Like There's another possibility. And that is, um, did you see that graph that were, when the Martian was talking and it went up and then it dripped a little bit? That dip was not caused by conservation. It wasn't caused. It was caused by the recession. So if we had a, a, a major economic collapse, global depression, where Chinese, because that was Chinese coal burning that stopped during that recession. Well, and that was the major reason China uh, export of goods went down, and that's the first time CO2 emissions went down in 40 years, and it was a recession that caused it. So if there's a global economic collapse, that uh, could get things started, but, yeah. yeah. So it seems like your, your pointing of your revolutionary catalyst was, was a running candidate. Or, sorry, Bernie Sanders. Um, how much, I mean, obviously his message is resonating with a lot of the younger gener generation that is uh, realizing these issues. You know, whether he wins or not, do you really think that that's going to start a movement? It's a, a president doesn't have that much power, even Bernie Sanders says it. Even if he's elected, he probably won't be able to do the things he wants to do. But at least he's a against coal and and, and blame the global recession on him whatever <laughs> but uh, yeah he's, he's my favorite I would say. To blame. but you know I don't know where the uh, the answers that it's easier to talk about the problem than yeah, yeah. I don't think he's going to propose that we kill uh, 20 million cows <laughs> vote for me Okay, are we done? Thank you, Jerry. Okay. Thank you very much. You go right, sure. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you so much. Good